The content of this podcast has not been evaluated by Health Canada or the FDA. It is educational in nature and should not be taken as medical advice. Always consult a qualified medical professional to see if a diet, lifestyle change, or supplement is right for you. Any supplements mentioned are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Please note that the opinions of the guest or host are their own and may not reflect those of Advanced Orthomolecular Research Incorporated. Hello and welcome to Supplementing Health, a podcast presented by Advanced Orthomolecular Research. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Herkel. This show is all about applying evidence-based and effective dietary, lifestyle, and natural health product strategies for your optimal health. We are going to feature some very engaging clinicians and experts from the world of functional and naturopathic medicine to help achieve our mission to empower people to lead their best lives naturally. This episode of Supplementing Health is brought to you by AOR's Zinc Copper Balance. Zinc is vital for growth and physical development and for the metabolism of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. AOR's Zinc Copper Balance provides a balanced, well-researched ratio of zinc to copper to ensure optimal absorption and function and to prevent the depletion of copper after long-term zinc supplementation. Look for it today at your local retailer or at AOR.ca or AOR.us. Hello again, and welcome back to Supplementing Health. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Herkel. We have a jam-packed podcast today, and I am going to be breaking down the immune system. Today's a solo show, so I'm not going to have anybody joining me, but I'm actually really excited to talk to you about the immune system and, and different parts of the immune system and how they play a role in helping build our immune resilience and our ability to basically be resilient to viral infections. And I'm going to be tackling it from an orthomolecular perspective. So uh, there's other shows where I'm going to be talking about herbals, but I'm really going to focus on vitamins, minerals, and molecules that normally you're going to find in your diet and your body is producing them all the time. And that's the definition of orthomolecular medicine. And in the first actually show that we did for supplementing health, I broke down orthomolecular and everything that goes into it. So if you want a little bit more information, go back and take a listen to that. And I also use vitamin C as kind of the, the key uh, poster child for orthomolecular medicine. So I will touch on vitamin C because you can't talk about the virus, uh, the viral infections and their ability to be resilient from an immune perspective without talking about vitamin C. But before I do that, I want to just break down the immune system and the way that our body is really intelligently set up, the way that we have our responsive immune system, which is called the adaptive immune system, and then our innate immune system, which is kind of our first line of, of defense. And so the innate immune system is what's protecting us day in and day out, every moment of the day. And that is what happens to keep us from getting infected with everything that we come in contact with. We are constantly exposed to viruses, bacteria. We are constantly exposed to our external environment. Even if you just think about the food that we are taking in, it's, it's full of things that could make us ill and sick. And the innate immune system is responsible for regulating basically our resistance to those things. And this is also very, um, you know, our immune system is unconscious, all of them, but this is kind of the analogy I use as our, uh, our border patrol. And so barriers have a lot to do with the integrity of our border. And a border could be something like a mucosal membrane in your nose. It could be something like the lining of your digestive system. So you're going to hear me throughout this episode talk about the integrity of our in gut lining, the integrity of our mucosal membranes. And so there are nutrients like zinc and vitamin A and vitamin D and omega-3s that are important for maintaining the integrity of our gut lining. And they are the ones often directly related to supporting the innate immune system. 
And there are a number of immune cells that are part of our innate immune system that, that basically are going to create this response. There also are immune system cells like dendritic cells that help dictate what is friend and foe, what is harmful and pathogenic and what is not. Also, you know, what you should be creating, the immune system should be creating a long-term or more uh, robust response, which is the adaptive immune system. So it's kind of like they are priming the cavalry, the full kind of like military response, the adaptive immune system. And these are usually uh, T cells in the body and B cells. And, and if anybody that's taken any immunology, you might be uh, familiar with those particular terms. But we need some, some, tor some sort of cells that are going to tell these attacking cells what they should actually be attacking. And those are the dendritic cells. They're the ones that help define what they should attack and prime the adaptive immune response. So you, you need to have both of these systems working in, ta in tandem. You need that kind of first line of defense, and then you need the adaptive immune system to create a, a more robust response when the infection actually gets past the initial barriers and gets through the defenses of the innate immune system. And so then you have T cells and B cells, as I mentioned, and T cells are kind of the direct antibacterial, antivirals. They have uh, properties that reduce cancer cells, and they basically are keeping things in check, and they have a number of mechanisms to be able to do that. Um, you know, they're are some cells that don't need the, you know, the priming from dendritic cells, like for example, natural killer cells, which play a huge role in having an antiviral effect. And then you need T cells that need the B cells to produce these antigens. And antigens are a, a fancy way of saying, you know what, these are markers that we're putting on the virus or on the bacteria or on the cell, and we've tagged that cell to be destructed. So then the T cells come by and they look for these particular tags that have been put there by the B cells and produced by the B cells, and then they can destroy those particular things. So that's why your normal healthy tissue doesn't get destroyed, and there's a very targeted response. So these are like, the T cells are like your sophisticated assassins. They're gonna go in and be very specific with what they're going to be, uh, what they're gonna be attacking. And then there's also a couple other cells that don't get as much attention as kind of the T cells and the natural killer cells. And, and then these are kind of, um, uh, helper cells, the T helper cells, and they also help regulate this T cell response. T when you talk about T cells, some of you may have heard of something called Th1 and Th2 balance. I've talked to, about this in other shows. There's a number of things in the natural health world that help regulate Th1 and Th2 balance. And what does this actually mean? Well, Th1 typically is responsible more for having a direct cytotoxic effect, whether it's cancer cells or whether it's antibacterial or antiviral. And when you don't have enough Th1 response, then you have poor antiviral and poor cancer surveillance functions. So you definitely wanna have an adequate Th1 response. Then there's also Th2 response, and both of these are kind of on two sides of a teeter-totter. You kind of want both functioning at uh, adequate level, but not too high or not too low. And so TH2 is primarily responsible for allergies, asthma, and some autoimmune diseases. So this is almost like, you know, responding to things that you should normally not be responding to, like pollen and certain foods. So you want to have a balance of both of these. And that's important to understand because healthy dendritic cells, healthy gut-associated lymphoid tissue, all that immune system, like 70% of the immune system, you've all heard the stats, that it's in and around the digestive tract, they're the ones that are regulating and creating this immune tolerance. And so that's the term that I use, immune tolerance, that should be contrasted with immune resilience. And I use those terms as really key, important, overarching 
concepts to help people understand you want to be resilient with a good innate immune system and a good healthy adaptive immune system, but you also want a tolerant immune system. And that is not excessive TH2 activation. So you have tons of allergies and eczema and asthma and a lot of those atopic conditions. So you need both. And that's where that gut lining and that's where the gut associated lymphatic tissue and the dendritic cells and the microbiome and probiotics play such an important role because they're the ones that are dictating the regulation. And, you know, continuing our immune conversation, there are cells called T reg cells, and they are important at counterbalancing excessive overreactions to things that it should not be overreacting to. And that is the key cell in the immune tolerance cascade. So we're constantly trying to fight the battle of infection, which is underreactivity, and that in most cases, and then sometimes inappropriate activity, like in the cases of COVID with the cytokine storm that you're all hearing about. And then there is immune tolerance, which is an, basically not having enough of, a, of an awareness at, at an immune level of not overreacting to something that it normally should not be harming you. Like for example, bacteria in your gut or a particular food protein. So we need adequate levels of all the cells, Th1, Th2, Th17, and Treg cells. And so that hopefully gives you a good overview, innate and adaptive immune system, and then there's T cells, and within that T cell category, there is this Th1, Th2 balance, and there's also Treg cells which help regulate the overreaction and helping improve the tolerance to self. And there's also TH17, which I didn't mention too much, but they are also very important and they play a role in autoimmunity as well, as well as the response to bacteria and, and viruses and fungus at the mucosal lining. So really the takeaway point, like with hormones and nutrients, it's like you want optimal levels, not too high, not too low. And that's the way that your body's going to be adequately responding without an inappropriate over response or an inappropriate under response. So that's kind of the key uh, overview. And so hopefully everyone that brings us everyone uh, on the same page. So when I talk about nutrients and I'll start with vitamin C, you're going to understand that that when we talk about balancing TH1, TH2 and adaptive and innate immune system, well, you'll know what we're talking about. Okay, so let's talk about vitamin C. We'll dive right in. And I'm, I'm going to try to cover as much as I can in this episode because there's so much information and I want to make sure that everyone really has a good understanding, at least of the main orthomolecular nutrients and vitamins and minerals when it comes to immune resilience and tolerance. I've talked about vitamin C in the past, and I'll probably talk about it again. Uh, you know, it, it has a very important role to play because it is used a lot by our immune cells. So our immune cells are constantly identifying and then creating a, a, a damaging response to a pathogen like a virus because it want, they want to either eat it up, so phagocytose it, like macrophages, maybe you've heard of ma macrophages and monocytes, they gobble up cellular debris and viruses, but they also use vitamin C as a key vitamin to offset some of the oxidative damage that they cause. So it's kind of like a self-regulating mechanism. Uh, and we know that vitamin C improves the function of neutrophils it improves the function of macrophages. And so there is a ton more of these particular cells being activated and recruited to the area of infection that you need a lot more vitamin C. And just from a very practical perspective, you know, vitamin C is not produced by the body. Our body needs to, to consume it through our diets. And so this is, you know, whether it's an evolutional, uh, evolutionary blip, uh, but it, it's one of those things that we relied on from a dietary perspective. And it, it's, not, it's not something like other mammals, this particular production of vitamin C was not conserved in our, in our evolution. And so we need to rely on it through diet. And so it often think about stress, think about free radical damage, uh, and, which is oxidative damage. 
Think about infections. There's a tremendous increased need at these times. So just because you're getting it through diet, you are going to need much higher levels in times of inflammation, in times of infection and oxidative stress. And I think, you know, there's this concept that a lot of integrative doctors have, have, have floated is that we are living in a, in a state that has increased our demands on a vitamin like vitamin C because it does such an important role at regulating our response from an immune perspective and our response to stress. And so we are kind of walking around with a suboptimal intra which is an, in, uh, an inter, so inside of our cell deficiency. And so it's maybe not a deficiency that could necessarily be tested in our bloodstream because the body tends to be really regulatory with that, but it, it is something that maybe we're not getting enough for optimal function. And then now you couple that with a, you know, a viral infection, let's say, and you need a much higher amount. And it's, as I mentioned, and this is evidenced by if you're taking vitamin C and you're healthy, you're eventually, as you keep increasing the dose, you're going to hit bowel tolerance. And at that point, your body just is not absorbing it. Your cells are not using it. And you're, you're basically excreting it digestively. And that's why it causes water uh, and loose stools. But as a person gets sick, what a lot of these clinicians, including myself, have noticed is that your bowel tolerance, let's say it was at 10 grams, goes up way higher to maybe 20 grams. And that's personalized and that's individual. Not everybody may get to that level. So it's something important to point out. And that definitely point that definitely leads us to believe that we have a much higher need for vitamin C when we're under the weather and we're sick. Another practical point about vitamin C is that you're probably going to need to take it more frequently to optimize blood levels because Vitamin C levels peak every four and a half hour, hours and you take it orally. It, it's quicker when you're taking it intravenously, which we'll not talk about in this, in this episode because that's a whole nother really intriguing topic about using vitamin C uh, as, a, as a really antioxidant in acute situations. And I know there's research on particularly um, you know, coronavirus with vitamin C being done around the world right now, which is, which is quite exciting. But from an oral perspective, you know, every four and a half hours, and what that means is that you need to be frequently taking it during the day. So if I hear a lot of my patients are like, oh, I take it in the morning. I got my vitamin C. I get, I know I took 2000 milligrams, but that's out of your body by lunchtime and you're not getting the full kind of protective effect. So at least twice a day and ideally maybe, uh, you know, three or four times a day if a person's feeling under the weather would be something that I would discuss with my healthcare provider. So that's something that, you know, is an important consideration for vitamin C. And, th and then there's liposomal. It, is that better delivered? There are some, you know, industry research showing that it is better delivered inside the cell. Again, liposomal, for those of you who don't know, is vitamin C basically combined with a fat. So it's able to be absorbed through our cellular membranes, which are fat soluble. And vitamin C is water soluble. So it primarily has a role to, to happen outside of our cells, but also within our cells where there's water, but not between. And so there is, you know, I do think that there might be some benefit from taking liposomal C. I still, from a cost-effective perspective and just from the, the breadth of research, I still like plain old ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate, which is the buffered version of it for kind of our general immune maintenance. So that's, that's a little bit of vitamin C. You know, one of the things I'm going to be touching on throughout this, this episode is the, the synergy between different nutrients. And so one of the nutrients that has been frequently cited in the research that is synergistic with vitamin C is bioflavonoids. And those are molecules of many different types that have, that normally are actually found in fruits and vegetables, those, those colors, those pigments those anthocyanins, those, those molecules that also have antioxidant properties and they basically help recharge vitamin C. And as an antioxidant, vitamin C gives a, an electron, quenches a free radical, but then it needs to be recharged, otherwise it's useless. And so there are, are molecules that help recharge vitamin C. Lipoic acid is one of them, bioflavonoids is one of them, and the one I wanted to talk about today is vitamin E. Vitamin E, I think, gets a really bad rap uh, because of, you know, some of the research that's come out to say, you know, 
um, aflatoxin, which is one out of only eight forms of vitamin E, by the way, it does you know basically does nothing, or maybe it might be harmful. And and we have to understand that the body works in synergy; it doesn't work in isolation. And so, just trying to isolate a nutrient especially one that there's eight versions of it, like vitamin E, and supplementing with that, you're really gonna, you really, you're setting yourself up for failure. And that's what we've seen in a lot of the research. But when we, and I, what I just mentioned about vitamin C is that it's a, it's a water soluble substance. So your, most of its action is going to be in water soluble spaces. So think of it, let's say between your cells in the intracellular space. Well, vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin. So it primarily hangs out in cellular membranes and fat soluble and fat rich areas, like for example, the brain, which is why vitamin E has been studied extensively in neurological uh, and nerve related conditions where vitamin C has not been as much. But what we're seeing is that vitamin E in its own right, because it's an antioxidant, it also plays a role in supporting the body's response to oxidative stress. So like, you know, even a reaction to a virus, vitamin E does play a role. So if you're deficient, which vitamin E is one of the most common deficiencies in North America, uh, some research showing 50% of people don't get the bare minimum amount of vitamin E from a dietary perspective, you're going to have an increased susceptibility to, to free radical stress. And again, this is another theme throughout this episode and throughout nutrients and nutritional interventions for immune resilience is that you may not have enough levels as a baseline in your bloodstream, in your cellular membranes, in your cells themselves to have an adequate response, which is might be one of the reasons a person may be more susceptible. We don't exactly know, but it's a theory. Uh, and so vitamin E plays a key synergistic role with vitamin C. It helps recharge vitamin C. And they, they are synergistic because one's fat soluble and one's water soluble. So I want you to think synergy when it comes to vitamin C and definitely vitamin E. Um, vitamin D, I'm, gonna, I'm going to save for a whole nother episode because it's so incredibly important. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer on that one right now. But needless to say, it does support both the innate and adaptive immune system. It is a fat soluble vitamin, but it also acts much like a hormone having a potent anti-inflammatory effect, an effect inside of the cell. So I, I'm a huge fan of vitamin D. Uh, and I will also say is that people that are deficient are the ones that, first of all, you need to get tested to figure it out if you are deficient. And then those are the ones that are going to benefit most from supplementation as they get their levels up. Once you get over that 75 nanomoles per liter here in Canada, that's where you're going to get most of uh, you know, the benefits from a respiratory function and from an immune supportive function. So that's all I'll say about vitamin D, but I, I am a big fan. And it's there's many, many things that are competing against the absorption of vitamin D, absorption of any sort of fats and the assimilations of fats. And so, you know, anything from having gallbladder surgery uh, to inflammation of the intestinal lining is all going to is all going to compete against your ability to produce vitamin D and to absorb it. And think about just from a sunshine perspective, vitamin D is created from cholesterol. And the number one most prescribed medication in the world is the statin class of drugs, and they decrease cholesterol. So, you know, we have to consider that fat soluble vitamins can be easily depleted when taking cholesterol inhibiting medications. Okay, so that's a bit of the fat soluble vitamins. Vitamin K is another one that is fat soluble, and I'll briefly mention it because it doesn't get a lot of uh, love when it comes to <clears throat> the immune function and the immune system, but I think it does play a key role in inflammation, and, and part of inflammation, especially as we're exploring more severe infections, is that there's this idea of coagulation and, and hypercoagulability. Coagula Ooh, that's a tongue twister. Uh, and, and that's part of that cytokine storm and the acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. Uh, and vitamin K as K1, vitamin K1 primarily found in those leafy greens, that has a big role to play with coagulation. But I want to focus more on vitamin K2 because that's the one that has a lot more to, to play with bone function. And we've probably heard about vitamin K2 for bone function. And 
that has a lot to play with protecting the overcalcification of our blood vessels. Why is that important when it comes to our immune function and, and building antiviral immune resilience? Well, if especially as the infection gets worse, the hypercoagulation starts building up, there's an increased risk for cardiovascular issues. And that's, again, we're seeing that in some of the numbers with, with coronavirus where you're getting a lot of impacts on the cardiovascular and the kidney systems. And now one of the theories is that you may have low levels of vitamin K that's protective of the vascular endothelium, which is the lining of the blood vessels. And so don't discount the importance of vitamin K, especially having adequate levels. And so there's a lot of synergy between vitamin D and K. And I will also mention vitamin A because vitamin A is often like vitamin E overlooked because it, again, it's, it, it's toxic in pregnancy. So a lot of people kind of throw it in the toxic category, but it's incredibly important. And it's worldwide. One of the biggest issues of, of deficiency in immune function, you know, the, <clears throat> The WHO has been on vitamin A deficiencies for a long time and, and usually in part of the vaccination program, especially in third world, third world countries, vitamin A is also injected at the same time. And so that may be responsible for some of the positive effects that may be even attributed to vaccination. Uh, and we have known for vitamin, D, d, vitamin A deficiency and the connection to the immune system for years, for decades. And it works on very much the same receptor as vitamin D. And it works inside of the nucleus, actually, at transcribing a lot of anti-inflammatory and antioxidant genes. So I, I think with vitamin A, if a person's deficient, you can actually get this tested. Your naturopathic doctor can test retinol to see if you have suboptimal levels. Uh, and with less and less people over the years, probably in the last century, consuming less organ meats, which is, by the way, the best way to get vitamin A, which you can also get toxicity if you overconsume it. We have case reports and stories from explorers eating, you know, polar bear liver getting toxic vitamin A overload. But I think now there's a much bigger issue with vitamin A deficiency than toxicity. So I think adequate levels are are. Are desirable and uh, a lot of people will might get that through the conversion of beta carotene which gives a lot of the colorful plants and and fruits that orange that bright orange color carrots are the richest in beta carotene just a note on beta carotene is that you can have a genetic predisposition for not being able to convert beta carotene adequately to vitamin a and so you can get this tested through a number of different genetic tests, uh, my blueprint from AOR is one example, and, and that will give you a really good idea if you actually are a good converter. And that way, if you, if you have this particular SNP, this deficiency in this enzyme for conversion, you're going to have to get preformed vitamin A, and, and that is primarily found in cod liver oil and liver in, in general, and in small amounts in, in other foods and other animal foods. So that is another issue that we should be considered uh, with vitamin A. But vitamin A is a really important one when it comes to building immune resilience and tolerance. Also, I think about vitamin A a lot when it comes to mucosal immunity at maintaining the integrity of those barriers. So not only is the immune system fighting off microbes and infections and in, in encounters, but there's also such things as physical barriers, like you know, the integrity in the intestinal lining, the integrity of the mucosal lining in your nose. And so things like zinc, vitamin A, vitamin D are absolutely integral for the proper physical barriers, as well as the innate immune system, which is our, our more immunological barrier. Okay, so that's a little bit about vitamin A. Uh, always talk to your, to your naturopathic doctor and your healthcare provider before starting, especially a fat-soluble vitamin, because there is risk for toxicity. Uh, vitamin C, there's zero risk for toxicity because that it's water soluble and out it goes if you have too much. But vitamin D, even though very safe, the, you could get toxic. Vitamin K, also very, very safe, uh, but there is a theoretical toxicity there uh, and obviously interactions with any coagulatory medications. And then vitamin A definitely have a high risk for toxicity if you have massive amounts. And most people are nowhere near these amounts. You have to take them for a long time, but always work with your healthcare provider. Uh, I want to mention. I want to switch gears here at, at, at this point to 
minerals. So I'm going to talk a little bit about zinc and I'm going to talk a little bit about selenium because these are, again, part of the foundational pieces, things that we'll normally get in our diet that we need a little bit more of when it comes to immune resilience. So zinc is a, a, a mineral that unfortunately is a massive deficiency problem. And it's not just a deficiency problem in third world countries. Uh, and it's a, it's a global deficiency problem. You know, uh, looking at some of the WHO data, they're estimating that maybe 30% of the world's population has deficient levels of zinc in their bodies. And zinc plays an important role in the growth, development, and healing of any sort of our tissues. It also is well known for wound healing and including ulceration. So that's even gut wounds healing. And then, uh, you know, there's specific forms of zinc, like zinc carnosine, which is one of my absolute faves forms of zinc it is incredibly helpful for that. And the integrity of the intestinal lining, the, the tight junctions, which keeps the in intestinal hyperpermeability at bay. Uh, and also, and this is one that often gets overlooked, it, zinc has a potent anti-inflammatory function. And we don't think of a zinc as an anti-inflammatory, but there's, there's lots of research pointing to its ability to regulate NF-kappa beta, which is a key pro-inflammatory molecule produced in the body at the cellular level in response to bacteria, viruses, and many other things. Uh, it's also been studied in cardiovascular disease, and we don't think typically of zinc in cardiovascular disease, but those research studies specifically were looking at and, and basically proclaiming that zinc's main action is an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant action, which is really overlooked, I would say, even in the, you know, in the natural health world. We think of zinc as immune supportive, which it is, and that's what I want to talk about here. Uh, it is important for the maturation, so basically the, the production of natural killer cells and, and many other immune cells. It's also very important for the, for the function of the thymus. And so it, the thymus is a gland that you know, is kind of under our sternum, and it kind of like atrophies as we age. And so that's why it doesn't get a lot of attention, especially in adults. But there's a, a substance called thymolin. And that is kind of a, a, a substance that the thymus gland produces and really important for the maturation of our immune system. And zinc is one of the key cofactors for the production of thymulin. So if you are zinc deficient, which 30% of the population is, you are not properly priming and setting up your immune system to properly recognize what's a virus, what's a bacteria, and what's our self tissue. So zinc deficiency plays a massive role in not just reducing inflammation, which is a key part of our immune response, but also in terms of the development of our immune system. Uh, if somebody's thinking, well, you know what, that zinc deficiency is something that just, you know, people that don't eat a diet in North America experience, uh, I th think, think again, because there's research coming out and there was a one particular study I'm thinking of 2010 that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition showing that adults and elderly in the U.S., were 30 to 40 percent deficient, 30, sorry, 30 to 40 percent of them were deficient in zinc. And that played a, that plays a role in their body's ability again for to creating an immune response. And if you, even if you look at the WHO data, the deficiency in zinc leads to millions of cases of preventable diarrhea, malaria, and pneumonia. And so this is not, you know, in some, you know, uh, tucked away in some really secret nutritional journal. This is this is mainstream uh, medical knowledge and mainstream research. So zinc deficiency is a is a big problem, and so I think it goes to it goes to re, stands the reason. Even if we understand that that we want to we want to up our immune resilience, is that we're going to have to up our zinc levels, uh, and specifically when it comes to antiviral effects of zinc is that it plays a role in the way that zinc, uh, sort of the way that viruses hijack our cells. And this is applicable to any type of virus. It, it zinc levels, adequate zinc levels inhibit the synthesis, especially of RNA viruses, like the Corona family of viruses, and they decrease their ability to hijack cellular machinery. So it's not just one receptor that plays a role 
in having these viruses bind and, and hijack our cells. There's many processes. And so zinc is now being postulated as one of the most important things to consider when it comes to boosting our immune system. And again, I hate that term boosting immune system. So I'm going to use, you know, supporting immune resilience, uh, but supporting our body's response to any sort of viral infection. A couple of practical points about zinc. Uh, if you're elderly, if you're vegan, consider you really need to get your levels tested and consider extra supplementation because typically zinc is found in animal meats. Uh, and oysters are the ones that are always pointed out in, in textbooks, nutritional documents. Uh, I know most people are not big oyster fans. You can over supplement with zinc. So usually the recommended dose uh, that is approved by Health Canada is around 15 to 30 milligrams, which is kind of an immune supportive dose. There's research, the one, the study I just cited in 2010, they were using 45 milligrams of zinc to replete that deficiency in the elderly. Uh, at those levels, you don't have to really worry about copper depletion, but you know, long-term use, you probably should. And so even like kind of two milligrams of copper. So I, I think a really good quality supplement like uh, AOR is a zinc copper balance, which, you know, the AOR has been on this for many years, trying to understand it and, and really su support the, the balance of both zinc and copper. Uh, but that ratio is great for long-term supplementation, but short-term you should be fine without copper. And also, you know, some people get nausea and a little bit of GI upset if they take zinc on an empty stomach. Um, it's not harmful to you to get that. It's just, you know, it's bothersome and annoying to get it. But if you do get it, you take it on empty stomach, a lot of people are like, oh, why am I nauseous? Well, grab some food because you and just think back, did I take my zinc a little too early before I ate? Uh, and there are forms like zinc carnosine, which is a form of zinc combined with the amino acid carnosine, which has a whole host of health benefits, powerful antioxidant. Actually, one of the key factors, that's um, possibly the reason why chicken soup is so helpful in the immune function is because it has higher levels of carnosine in chicken flesh. And so that, you know, has some of the, its own immune supportive effects. But carnosine, I'm a big fan of healing tissues and zinc obviously does that as well. It is better tolerated in my experience because it's more slowly absorbed. And that's one of the reasons it's used a lot in digestive function. And in Japan, it's used as a, as a medication actually for ulcers. And so I'm a huge fan of this particular form of zinc carnosine. So that's a little bit about zinc. And, and I think hopefully, you know, the key takeaway is that this is one of the things that we should be making sure we have adequate levels of amounts uh, in our body to maintain immune tolerance and resilience. I'm going to conclude with talking a little bit about selenium. So that's another mineral that that is often talked about when it comes to the immune system. It is it is a mineral that is found in foods. Uh, one of my favorite sources of selenium is Brazil nuts. And selenium has a number of key roles in the body, but one that it's well known for is that it's a key cofactor in the production of glutathione. And glutathione is our body's own master antioxidant and has a lot to do with our immune system, actually. More and more viruses and bacteria can spread because they use free radicals as part of the hijacking process of our immune system. And so when we have adequate levels of glutathione, then our bodies can quench these tools and mechanisms that viruses use to hijack our cells. I've heard of selenium being uh, this, the term birth control for viruses being thrown around by experts I have to give a shout out to Dr. Alex Va um, Vasquez for introducing me to that term, but I, I know other experts have, have talked about that, but that's kind of the way that it, it is a good way of understanding selenium as birth control for viruses. It also has potent anti-inflammatory effects in its own right, as well as its ability to support glutathione. Uh, and it may support kind of blood flow uh, and sorry, uh, lymphatic flow, which is a very unique mechanism of action. You know, an interesting point about selenium is that there are areas in the world and there are parts of North America that it, this is the case, is that the soils where primarily we get, where we grow our plants and then we, then we get the selenium levels from, is that they're deficient in selenium. There's a, an endemic selenium deficiency. And, and interestingly enough, China is one of the areas in the world that is known, famously known to have a selenium deficiency in their soils. And... 
when you look at a lot of the historic, historically, you look at a lot of the outbreaks of, of viruses. I mean, a lot of people are thinking, well, you know, why are they always, why is this always happening in China? And, you know, some experts are starting to say, and this again, Dr. Vasquez has talked about this. And I think I agree with them is that what factors are contributing to having, you know, China as being kind of ground zero for a number of these viral outbreaks. Like, for example, the first uh, coronavirus now, obviously, the second one, uh, the bird flu, and, and there's there's many others. And so the the le- low levels in, in soil may be contributing to the body's ability to de- have a decreased resistance to viruses. So just having optimal selenium levels is going to be very helpful for our body to, to maintain levels of glutathione and maintain immune resilience. From a supplementation perspective, you know, roughly you're going to find supplementation anywhere from 500, like doses from 500 micrograms. Remember, this is micrograms, not milligrams. We need a very little amount of selenium uh, up to 200 micrograms. So that's a fairly safe dose for short term use. Always, again, talk to your healthcare provider to find the right dose for you. A couple of the things I really love selenium for is for, and the research shows this beneficial effect in autoimmune thyroid conditions. And again, it comes down to the production of glutathione and even the autoimmune viral conditions. Again, this is an episode that we'll do in, you know, in the future, talking about the connection between autoimmunity and chronic viral conditions and specifically Epstein-Barr virus has been linked to Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is a common autoimmune thyroid condition. And so selenium is high on the list when it comes to regulating and decreasing these overreactivity of the immune system to the thyroid, uh, thyroid peroxidase uh, and this particular enzyme in the thyroid. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview of selenium, zinc, vitamin C, We've talked a little bit about vitamin K and vitamin A. These are kind of like your core orthomolecular ingredients. This is really not fancy. And so, you know, one thing I'll conclude with is a lot of people are like, what is the latest antiviral drug and vaccine and herb? And, you know, we're very focused on, you know, like quercetin is a great example where that became really, really popular. But I think when you look at the evidence, you know, making sure you have adequate vitamin C, D, A, K, and levels and then also zinc and selenium, you're going to do a lot more to support your body's immune resilience. And, and these are things your body's going to be using for many other beneficial effects. Nothing against quercetin, great antioxidant substance. It is a little bit more expensive and it's not something your body is using for as many different things. When it gets to herbs, you, you, there is a much narrower therapeutic window and there's a less breadth of, of, I guess, you know, specific application. And so I, I'm really promoting and supportive with my patients for using orthomolecular nutrients to, that should be in optimal levels like zinc and selenium and vitamin D and, and vitamin C to actually build our immune resilience and build our immune tolerance. Uh, so th- thanks for tuning in for this show of Supplementing Health. Hopefully everyone found it helpful. This was great to share. Uh, Please tune in next week again as we talk a little bit more about the immune system. And, uh, And as always, thanks again for listening and have a great week. Thank you for listening today. For more information about our guests, past shows, and future topics, please visit aor.ca slash podcasts. Do you have a topic that you want us to cover? We invite you to engage with us on social media to request a future topic or email us at marketing at aor.ca. We hope you tune in again next week to learn more about supplementing your health.